Well, it's a joy to be celebrating the resurrection of our Lord this morning with all of you. Um, I want to read these beautiful words because uh, you just, this is what all of humanity, all of history is hinged on right here. I'm going to read it out of Matthew 28. <clears throat> now after the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave. And behold, a severe earthquake had occurred, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. And his appearance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. The guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. The angel said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who has been crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, just as he said. Come see the place where he was lying. And my devotional this morning kind of built on that, and I just wrote down a couple things here. When he said, come and see, you know, the, the stone, it said it wasn't rolled away so that Jesus could come out. It was rolled away because they were invited in to see that it was as he had said. And so the, my devotional said, um, come and see Mary, who, who cries out, Rabboni. Rabboni. Come and see Thomas, the holes in his hands and side. Come and see James, that your brother is Lord. Come and see Saul, killer of Christians. Come and see teachers, that he is the law that you so love. Come and see history, that the flow of time is bent around him in a triumphant arc. And come and see skeptic, his, his hand is still reaching out to you today. So, and there were more, I just couldn't write them all, but, um, you know, he is risen. Uh, Ali, uh, Christos Anesti, he is risen. Well, Alethos Anesti. Alethos, indeed, he is risen. So let's worship. <laughs>
our name. He knows us by name. That's the amazing thing. Thank you, Lord. All glory 
Bless your name, Lord. We thank you that you have triumphed over sin, over the grave, and over death. Lord, you have won the victory. And Lord, because you live, we live. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Bless you, Lord. Amen. You can be seated. They, they, uh, I'm like the fifth string announcement person <laughs> so I'm I'm batting today so uh, but I just wanted to share a couple there's only one announcement that I have um, the Easter egg hunt is at 1145 yes. am I correct Linda correct. any specific rules yes. <laughs> the rules are there are no rules yes. run over whoever you have to to get the egg I'm just kidding <laughs> After Sunday school, those children that are upstairs get reunited with their parents because the parents, at quarter to um, quarter to twelve, the parents and the child, accompanied by the parent, will then go outside. Last year there was a little confusion of when it started, so so come up, get your your child, and then at quarter to twelve we'll meet you outside. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Um, before we get into praying, um, I'm going to pray for a prayer request and then pray for the kids to be released. But before that, the first prayer request, I don't, it's in the prayer request, but it says, Happy birthday to Chuck. So evidently, we're going to pray for your birthday. 
But happy birthday. Happy birthday. Let's just uh, take a moment to pray uh, for Phil and Jeff. Lord, right now we're, just, uh, we're thankful for both Phil and Jeff. Um, we're just praying right now as Phil continues to recover from his injury with his leg, that you just continue to heal that. And I pray just for complete healing quickly so that he can recover quickly and be able to do all the things he wants to do again. And Lord, we pray also uh, for Jeff as he had that knee replacement surgery. And obviously it, it is doing well because Jeff's jogging already. And so we're thankful for Jeff being able to be here and recovering. But we're just praying that you just complete that healing uh, today. Lord, we just ask in Jesus' name. We're praying for Amanda, who's a young single mom uh, who had a stroke. We're praying right now for her healing. Lord, that you just touch her body right now, touch her mind right now. Lord, we ask for complete healing as she has that responsibility of being a single mother, uh, which is not an easy thing in itself, but having a stroke just makes life harder. So we're just praying right now for complete recovery uh, for Amanda, Lord. We're praying also for... Um, a young mom uh, with two children. She's praying for a home that she needs a place to live that's affordable. So we're just praying for her, that her as well, Lord, that you would help them figure that out, that you would just make everything work in their favor, Lord, that it would all come into place um, exactly how she would want it, Lord. We thank you also for the children we have here this morning. As they get ready to go upstairs to, to learn about you and to have a good time, we're praying, Lord, that you would touch them, that, that they would have the openness and, and ready to prepare, not only just to have fun, but to really just receive you today. Um, move up there in incredible ways, as you're going to do down here as well. Um, we're grateful for them, and we're thankful, Lord, that we have them here. Bless them today in Jesus' name. Amen. Kids can be released to go upstairs, and we are going to take a moment to greet each other. So take a couple minutes to greet each other.
amazing. He's a Christian rapper, by the way, KB. They call him doctor now because he's a doctorate degree holder. You could tell the intelligence, um, incredible, gifted. Everything he said is true and awesome this morning for us. Um, we're here to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus, but the reality of this is, is that we celebrate the death and resurrection of Jesus every single day. Like, yeah, once a year we come at this time and we're like, yeah! But really, as Christians, every single day we should wake up and go, yeah! Like, he's not just alive like today. It didn't just happen this morning, by the way. It happened a while back. And he's alive. I'm going to continue the series Greater today. I'm going to end it today with Greater Life is the title of the message today. Now, some of you guys will probably get a little annoyed as I start sharing this message because maybe you've done this already, but I'm kind of going to prove that you can use the same exact passages of Scripture like five, six, even seven times and have something new every single time. Like the Bible literally says it's living. The Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, able to pierce the heart of man, dividing even bone and marrow. The Word of God is powerful, it is amazing, and it is deep. And so I'm going to read a passage, and I'm going to say some of the same things that I said Multiple times, you've heard these things. So you're going to be like, I already heard this. You're going to get annoyed for a minute. That's okay. Sometimes repetition is a good thing, right? So I'll tell my son, he's playing football and basketball. He's getting ready to prepare for football. He's going to start doing some training with his older brother. And it's going to be repetition, right? Repetition makes you better. You get better at things the more. So me learning and, and, and be able to continue to hear the word of God over and over and over again, even if it's the same passages, because the word of God is living. So every single time you get something new something fresh, something amazing. I was reading this week something regarding the scriptures. You know the, the Bible is the only religious text ever, ever written where unspiritual historians say it is a reliable source of truth and history. So there's nothing else like it. It is actually fact. It is confirmed. All the prophecies that have been fulfilled is an amazing, amazing document that we have that is not just a normal piece of paper, but literally as it comes into our lives and into our hearts, Life explodes out of us. Amen? So I'm going to do this. I'm going to go into a passage. I'm going to do some of the same things I did before. Just warned you ahead of time. So when you're hearing it, you're like, am I hearing the same sermon? Kind of, but it's going to change in a little bit. John chapter 10. Starting with verse number 1. And for those who weren't here, I'm going to do some of the same explanations because some people might not have heard this. So um, just go with it, right? If you heard it, just like this was good the first time. It's also good the second time and the third time, Right? Truly, truly, I say to you, the one who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep, but climbs up over the other, other way, he is a thief and a robber. But the one who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. To him, the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep listen to his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. When he puts all his own sheep outside, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. However, a stranger, they simply will not follow, but will flee from, the, from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus told them this figure of speech, but they did not understand what the things, uh, did not understand what the things which he was saying to them meant. So Jesus said to them again, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the, of the sheep. All those who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pastor. The thief comes to only to, to steal, to kill, and destroy. I came so that they would have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who is not the owner of the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters the flock. He flees because he is a hired hand and does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my own. And my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of the fold. I must bring them also. 
and they will listen to my voice, and they will become one flock with one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life so that I may take it back. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay down my own. I have the authority to lay it down, and I have the authority to take it back. This commandment I received from my Father. I'm going to stop there. Pretty awesome passage. It's worth preaching 18 times a year, possibly. But for those in context that don't understand what's happening in this passage, he is in this passage dealing with religious people who are questioning the fact that he had just healed somebody and they examined the healing and said, basically, this, is a, this Jesus is not a healer. He's not this, that, and the other. So they're questioning him, and they're trying to put the law on the people. Remember the Old Testament law that Jewish people lived by? They were waiting for a Messiah, but they were rejecting Jesus, who was the Messiah. So there was this conversation happening back and forth. So Jesus basically just laid it out to them. This is what's happening. And an illustration of what he was talking about here was very simple. Back in that time period, we'd, you would have a sheep pen. It would be a circle, right, a big circle wall, half wall, that had an opening. And that opening is where the sheep would come in and out. And there's not really a physical door there, but in this passage, Jesus is saying, I am the door. I am the gate. I stand in the gate, gate so that the only way you can get in is to go through me. But if you climb over the wall or try to get another way, you aren't going through me, then you're not going to get in. Right? You're not getting it in this way. You have to only go through me. So he's kind of laying out this idea that your law, your plans, the things that you're talking about, you're trying to reject me and try to preach this different thing, that you're not going to get there that way. The only way you're going to get to the Father is to go through me. So Jesus was laying it out to them pretty heavy, I would say, and multiple times talks about, I lay down my life for my sheep. I lay down my life for my sheep. I, my favorite part was, though, though that I don't, nobody, nobody took my life from me. I have the authority to lay it down, but also I have the authority to take it back, which means I'm not just going to die because you said you're going to kill me. I'm going to do so because of the love I have for my sheep that I'm going to lay my life down, and I'm so awesome that you can't keep me there. That's the, I need you to know ahead of time, before I even go to the grave, because Jesus isn't dead yet, before I even get there, I have authority. You have no power over me. And I'm going to speak specifically about one verse in this passage today. Um, and then I'm going to go back into Genesis, which I did before. Again, you're going to love this. Genesis chapter 3. It's Easter. Why not? Verse number 10. The thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy. So he's speaking of the people who climb over the wall to get in other ways. So he says the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I'm like thinking about it. I'm like, what does he mean by thief? So I looked it up in the Greek word thief used in John 10.10 10 means one who steals. <laughs> That's deep, right? That's really deep. It's, it's one who steals. He's speaking of false teachers. He's speaking of false prophets. He's speaking of those who have come and are preaching a different gospel or different message of a way to get to heaven than Jesus taught. So anybody who brings you in a different direction or, di or, dist or, or, or distracts you from the truth would be a false teacher or a false prophet. Anything or anybody that takes you in a different direction than to Jesus, who is the gate to the sheep pen, is a lie, is what he's saying. They're thieves. They're liars. They're coming for one reason and one reason only, well, more than one reason, to rob, to kill, and to destroy, is the reason why they come. There's no other reason. So I started thinking about this. There's a lot of false teachers. We've had a lot of false prophets and a lot of false teachers, even in modern day, right? A lot. There's been a lot over the last thousand years, two thousand years um, since Jesus. There's been a lot. We can go through them, right? There's um, a woman by the name of Ellen White who or created the Seventh Day Adventist Church. She was their prophetess, and now they have this floating prophet thing going on, to where a new prophet comes every now and then, and they can change everything they believe. It becomes just a new. Th I want. I don't want to be a prophet of that kind of a place. But Joseph Smith, who created Mormonism, false prophet. Distracts from who Jesus is. Jehovah's Witness religion was, be, was born out of Charles Russell. Muhammad created Islam. Buddha, which was even before Jesus, but still created this enlightenment idea, which you can't really be enlightened, right? not the way he taught about, but you can be enlightened in Jesus. But there's no other way. So there's, there's false prophets, there's false teachers, but even within the Christian or normal religions that we follow, right? there are people who have been false teachers who have taught things that were not biblical. 
And so there's always somebody who's trying to get in from the wall, over the wall. There's always somebody who's trying to get into the church to cause distraction. There's always somebody who's trying to cause you and I to be distracted from who he is. So our life gets caught up in all the other stuff and not in Jesus, right? There's always somebody coming in. But also there's always somebody trying to distract those that don't know Jesus, saying this is not the way. Follow another way. Follow this direction. This is okay. But when you get into it, you start realizing none of these point towards Jesus and a relationship and intimacy with Jesus, which is what the cross was for, that we would walk with Jesus. So then I said, I want to go back in time because there's a, there's a moment in Genesis chapter 3. I'm not going to read all of it, but there's a moment where I can see kind of the beginning of this. And it's kind of ironic because I'm, I'm reading in John 10, 10 where, you, where you hear him saying that they won't listen to strangers, Right? Because they know, they know that they're not me, right? They know my voice. So when they hear a stranger, they won't listen to strangers. So you have that clearly in that passage being talked about. But here in Genesis chapter 3, where everything went down, where sin entered the world, the thing that separated us from God happens in, John, in Genesis chapter 3, and I'm going to read it. Now the serpent was more cunning, this is Satan, by the way, than any animal of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God really said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, from the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it or even touch it, or you will die. So in other words, she's just saying, yeah, he said that. What you said, did he really say that? Yeah, he said that. And then the serpent said to the woman, you certainly will not die. So he immediately goes against what God had told them. Now, now the thing is, is with the tree, um, the tree is not special, by the way. It's probably like any of the other trees. There's nothing, anything special about it except God in his love for us and wanting to create us for relationship created a choice, an opportunity to follow him or to not follow him. To follow him required that we would be obedient, right? That's just the way it is. He's God. He's got a standard that is so high that we can't attain it. But he wants it to be a choice. So this tree is put in the middle that we have a choice. We can continue to be obedient and follow God. He's given us everything, like the entire garden, beautiful, all the animals, everything that's there. It's incredible. He's given us everything. They're walking. When we talk about the passage here that said, um, and I come to give abundant life and life abundantly, they had abundant life. They had abundant life beyond what we can even have in the physical now, even with Jesus living in us, right? Because they actually walked with God in the garden, had connection with God. They knew everything they knew was good because they knew God and everything was perfect and everything was in place and sin did not enter into the world. Yet, this tree was just a tree that if they were to touch it, it would be a sign of disobedience, which would cause separation from them and God. They knew his voice, just like the scripture talks about in John. They, later on, you're going to hear they hear the voice of God as he walks through the garden, and they knew it was him. They were ashamed, and they covered themselves up because they had sinned. So the same way that we know the voice of our Savior, they knew the voice of God as they walked closely with him. So I, he comes in and says, you, will, you certainly will not die. And so we're going to go back just to see for sure what God said in Genesis chapter 2, verse 17. But from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For on that day, if you eat from it, you will certainly die. So, of course, God did say that to them. That confirms it. I just want to confirm that what she was saying was true. Romans chapter 6, 23, just part A, says the wages or the payment of your sin is death. So for them to be disobedient would be sin. It would cause death. It was an automatic response to that. But I'm thinking about this thing, and I'm like, like here is... Eve, walking in the garden, all things good, nothing's bad. A serpent starts talking to you. By the way, if a snake ever starts talking to you, we got counseling available. Like if it happens, we'll make it happen. We'll sit down with you. But um, I have no idea what the garden was like. Who knows? Maybe they communicated. It was so perfect. Maybe who knows? But this serpent comes and begins to talk with her. And I know the way that I was taught, like stranger danger, stranger danger, she's living in a perfect world, walking with God, and a stranger begins to speak to her. And even though she knows the voice of God and had followed God and lived closely and had abundant life and everything was perfect, she still was enticed by this stranger. 
There's a reason why later on now when you see all these people preaching false doctrines and people, people trying to preach against Jesus or all this kind of stuff, the reason why it happens, the reason why enemy uses those methods is pretty simple. He knows that some of us will be susceptible to listen to the stranger and not to the voice of Jesus. Right? He says, my people will know my voice. They won't listen to the voice of a stranger. But at times, the enemy knows when we're weak. He comes in and he tries to distract us. Watch what happens in Genesis chapter 3 because she's listening to the serpent. For God knows that one day you eat from it, or on the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will become like God. It's almost like he's trying to get her to want to do the same thing he wanted. He wanted to be like God. He wanted her to fall and become like God. But here's what really gets me, knowing good and evil. She already knew good. She lived with God. Only thing new that happened by her eating of the fruit is she now knew evil. How would she be like God? She would know good and evil. How does God know both good and evil? Because God is good and he is perfect and he knew no evil. But when he created Satan, who was an angel, decided I want to be like God and decided I'm going to control heaven and become a charge. And God's like, no, that's not going to happen, right? And so Satan is thrown down from heaven and that was the beginning of evil. So God knew it. He saw, he knew it. He see, so for the first time, even for God, God's perfect. God was holy. He only knew good. Now he knows evil. So now she becomes like God, knowing both good, and now she knows evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to her eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise. So she saw the food was good, and she, it was a delight to her eyes, and now she's like, it will make me smart wise. So I'm going to eat from this. What do those things all have in common? They're all selfish. Every single thing that she saw, like all of a sudden out of nowhere, wait, I could be like God. I can, this fruit now looks good. Because <laughs> now that I know I can be like God, right? That's the, that's the end of it. The end of me eating this fruit is I can be like God and know both good and evil. So the end result is now, it's got, now it looks good to me. Now it's delightful to the eye. And now I want to be wise in this way. So she took from the fruit and she ate. And she also gave some to her husband with her, and he ate. And the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked for the first time ever. They were exposed. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves waist coverings. And of course, at, right after this is where they hear God walking towards them. Adam, what have you done? So they hear the voice of God again. This is the problem we have today. There's a dilemma. There is one that comes to rob, to kill, and destroy. And there is one that gives, comes to give life and life abundantly. Jesus came because of what took place back then. And he came to give an opportunity for us to get back to abundant life. So he comes and gives us, gives us opportunity, but we're always faced with this dilemma. Do I do what I want to do and be selfish and become my own God? And follow my own way and my own patterns and things that are desirable to me? Or do I follow Jesus into abundant life? And then if I do, what does abundant life look like? There are some people nowadays who teach that abundant life looks like in a church. i be honest, Christians who say, um, this is what abundant life looks like. You come to our church, and then if, if the more money you give, the more God's going to give you. You give a bigger tithe or offering, and then all of a sudden, you're going to start having Rolls Royce. Rolexes. I don't really want a Rolex. I don't even really like this thing that much. It's kind of, having something on my wrist kind of bothers me. But you, the idea is that is I'm coming to a place, and I'm giving to a place so that I can have more physical gain. More of what I want. Again, it feeds it. Even though it's a church that talks about Jesus, the mindset and the idea is I want to be blessed and I want to have more and more and more until I realize more and more and more of what I want is not enough. Matter of fact, Ecclesiastes chapter 5, 10, 5, 10 through 15. One who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor one who loves abundance with its income. This too is utility. When good things increase, listen to this, those who consume them increase. In other words, the more I get of what my flesh desires, I'm really getting more of me. I am increasing, God is decreasing in that way of thinking. So what is really 
abundant life. Is abundant life that Jesus offers, that is counter to what the enemy offers, which is to rob, kill, and destroy you, by the way. It's not really that good. <laughs> but, uh, here you go. Would you like me to rob, kill, and destroy you? Sure. But abundant life, what is it? It's not the death that Adam and Eve experienced, because he said you will die, and they did die, sure enough. The very first death they experienced after their disobedience was a spiritual death. There was a separation now between them and God. They even got kicked out of the Garden of Eden, and angels were put outside so they could not enter back in, right? So there was a separation between them and God that happened, but then those who were supposed to live forever and ever and ever in the Garden with abundant life now had to die a physical death. So Jesus comes and says, I'm going to offer you abundant life. And abundant life is not just that you're going to have a great life here on earth, but when you die, you don't die, right? That you live forever and ever in heaven and eternity with Jesus. So there's an abundant life that's offered. But what does that mean for us now? So we're going to look at what Jesus talked about a little bit when it comes to abundant life or greater life, we'll call it. Because it's one thing to know what the enemy has given and offered and what we've been living with most of our lives. By the way, if you were born, you were born in sin because of the flesh nature that we have, because we were born of the seed of Adam, who was sinful by nature. So you and I are sinful by nature. I know a lot of people say, I'm good. I don't do a lot wrong. But God's standard is so righteous and so holy, just one lie is enough to cause that separation between us and him. And so all of a sudden, that one lie or the one deceit or the one selfish act, and then it could pile over our lifetime, and we're just more and more living in sin and living in that way of living. And that's a life that leads to death because the Bible's clear. The wages of sin is death. So you keep living in sin, you will die both a physical and a spiritual death. However, Jesus came and he offered something different. So John, chapter 6, verse 26 through 35. Jesus answered them and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate some of the loaves. They're talking about he just not fed them 5,000 people with fish and loaves. You, but because you ate some of the loaves and were filled. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that lasts for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him the Father God has set his seal. Therefore, they said to him, What are we to do so that we may accomplish the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, this is the work of God that you believe in him who he sent. So they said, That's pretty easy. Like, what, what kind of work should we have to do to be able to? You don't do any work, you just believe in him who God has sent. It's really all it is. It's that kind of simple that he's laying out. But believe in him who God has sent. Sorry, I lost my spot. So they said to him, what then are you doing as a sign so that we may see and believe you? What work are you performing? Our father ate manna in the wilderness. As it was written, he gave them bread out of heaven to eat. So the manna fell from heaven in the Old Testament. They woke up in the morning and came out to their tent, and there's a bunch of bread on the ground. Like it rained bread. So that's what they're talking about here. Their fathers were, were God took care of them when they were, walk, when they were traveling, and they had not looked for food. Literally, manna came from heaven, and they had food. So they're kind of reminding Jesus of this as if he didn't know. He gave them bread out of heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it is not Moses who, gave, who has given you the bread out of heaven. That's an important word. It is not Moses. That was their mindset, that Moses is the reason why this happened. This is sometimes a problem with us in church. Sometimes we think it is us that gives somebody something, right? The blessing that you received, that this person did it. No, God just used that person to do it. God's the one that blessed you. I get up here and I preach and say, oh, that's good. Uh, no, that was not my word. That was God's word, and the Holy Spirit spoke through me. I will not take credit for it. You guys get mad at me sometimes. People are like, I know you don't want to take credit for it, but I'm like, no, it had nothing to do with me. This is his word. I'm just saying it. I'm just repeating what he already said, right? Because it's God doing the work. It's God doing it, but they're saying Moses. So truly, truly, I say to you, it is not Moses who has given you this bread out of heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread out of heaven. Now hear this. 
For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. Not just life, but abundant life. Then they said to him, Lord, always, always give us bread. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. The one who comes to me will not be hungry. The one who believes in me will never be thirsty. It's a kind of a life that he gives to us. It is so rich, so incredible. But what, what does he mean by that? Is he talking about physical hunger? I mean, according to Scripture, right, the Bible says that those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, and Jesus is the righteousness of God, so he's talking about Jesus in that passage, that those who hunger and thirst for righteousness shall be satisfied. Remember Ecclesiastes, those who are rich and have all this, they'll never be satisfied with it. He's saying that what I give you, you will be satisfied. It is a life to overflowing. It is not normal life. It is abundant life. It is not just abundant life. It's resurrection life. John chapter 7, verse 37 through 39. Now on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and he cried out saying, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. The one who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost beings will flow rivers of living water. But this, he said, in reference to the Holy Spirit who had not come yet, or not whom those who believed in him were, not, were, not, or were to receive, but hadn't yet. For the Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So Jesus speaking of the moment, this is the moment, right? This is what he's talking about. The very moment you surrender your life to Jesus... What happens? You surrender to Jesus. He forgives your sins. That's beautiful. But then he comes and fills you with his Holy Spirit. And as the Holy Spirit fills you, you now begin to experience abundant life. As the Holy Spirit fills you, you now begin to no longer thirst. I can tell you, this is a true fact of life. Um, I, I'm human, so I still have things that my flesh desire comes up every now and then. You know, every now and then it happens. But I will tell you that the shift that took place in my life when I surrendered my life to Jesus was monumental. And it wasn't like I did it, and it wasn't like somebody told me to do it. My desires just began to change. I didn't have a hunger for certain things anymore. I didn't have a thirst for certain things anymore. It wasn't like somebody from the pulpit said, Chris, don't do this. It's not like I had people walking around me. The people I had with me were just awesome people who loved me. And they didn't tell me too much about rules. I just started walking with Jesus and things started changing. My hunger started changing. My thirst began to change. I didn't care for the desires that I once had before, whether it be alcohol, direct sex, whatever it might be. I just didn't have that desire the same way that I did as a 17-year-old young man. The hunger shifted. And I became satisfied. Fulfilled. Filled with so much peace and joy that it's unexplainable. But it had nothing to do with anything except for I did what exactly what this passage said. I believed in him and surrendered my heart to him. Simple. No work involved in the process. John eleven seventeen through 26. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. Speaking of Lazarus, who was dead in the tomb. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about 15 stadia away. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary, to console them about their brother. So then Martha, when she heard that Jesus was coming, went to meet him, but Mary stayed in the house. Martha then said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, I said that before to Jesus, my brother would not have died. Even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise from the dead. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise on the, in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. By the way, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you and me as believers. That's powerful. That's a resurrection life inside of you and me. He says, I am the resurrection and life. And he says this, the one who believes in me will live. Even if he dies. And everyone who, will li who, li who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? In other words, same message every single time. I am the resurrection and the life, and the one who believes in me will live. But they won't just live. They'll have abundant life. 
I'll explain what I think abundant life really is in a moment. But before that, I'm going to go through a couple passages really quick. They're not on the screen. They're just really fast. John 14, 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. In other words, Jesus, just like he was the gate of the sheep pen, you cannot get to heaven unless you believe in Jesus and go through him. There is no other way. Contrary to popular belief in the year 2024, what Jesus spoke 2,000 years ago never changed. He didn't change his mind over time. He didn't like all of a sudden say, no, maybe you can get through another way. Like it's, there is no other way. And it's a fact. And now we want to say, well, I believe this. And everybody's like, well, this is, this is my truth. There's only one truth. Truth is not subjective. I can't just make up truth as I go. In 2024, you can make up truth as you go. It's popular to do so, that we want to make up truth as we go. But the truth is the truth. It's always been the truth. And there's only one way to get to the Father. That's through Jesus. Believe in him. John 3, 16. You all know this one. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever or whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Simple. Believe in him. Eternal life. John 8, 12, again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. I love the change of words there. Believes in me and then follows me. Because the word believe in every one of these passages is not what you think it is. It's not a simple, I believe in my mind. It is a, I believe wholeheartedly is the mindset in the Greek of, this, of these words. He's saying, it is, uh, I believe to the point where I'm going to lay my life on the line. I believe to the point where I'm going to surrender who I am to you and let you do a work in my life. That I will no longer live a life that is robbed, killed, and destroyed, but I will live abundant life that Jesus offers by surrendering my life and my will to you, Lord. Galatians 2, 20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Powerful passage. This is what it means to believe. right? This is what it means to believe in Jesus. I have been crucified with Christ. That I no longer live, but but Christ lives inside of me. He is in control. He is in charge of my life. And the life I now live, I live in the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who gave himself up for me. Powerful passage. Start thinking about this, that video that we watched a little bit ago, second one, the last one. That was the third one, wasn't it? I can count. Not real high, though. If you get to like (laughs) seven, I'm pretty much done at that point. So I start thinking of all of this. I think of the passage that he spoke at the very end of his message, 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 55 through 57. Satan came to bring, to rob, to kill and destroy. And back in the garden, he caused death, physical and spiritual death. Jesus comes to the cross, dies for us, is raised from the dead. That resurrection life is now available to every single person who says, I will believe and follow you, Jesus. And at the moment we do so, the Holy Spirit comes and lives inside of us. And then this passage becomes really relevant. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? I can imagine, see, Paul wrote this, but it would be really cool that if when Jesus um, was crucified, if he just would have went down to get the keys of heaven, and while he was down there, he just looked at Satan and said, where, O oh death, is your victory? So I kind of feel like he did. I think Paul was just repeating. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we're celebrating today. And that's what he talks about. Abundant life is not just a life that is filled with goodness, but is a life that conquers death. Abundant life conquers death, conquers sin, conquers the desires of the flesh. All of those things, we walk in complete victory, and that death no longer has a hold on us. Romans 6, we read it earlier, part A, for the wages of sin is death. Next part. For the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So it started off, the wages of sin is death. Your payment for your sin is death. But the free gift of God, on the other hand, is like, death, where is your sting? Death, where is your victory? It's swallowed up in Christ. So I started thinking, what does abundant life look like? Here's what it looks like. 
It looks like somebody who has surrendered their life to Jesus, surrendered their will to Jesus. I'm not just going to believe, but I'm going to follow. And as a result of that, I am now, as we know the fruit of the Spirit talks about, I am now filled. We talk a lot about the fruit of the Spirit, like it comes out of you. But what about what happens first? What happens first is it goes into you, right? What happens first is that when I am filled with the Holy Spirit, I am filled with the love of God, which is unbelievable, uncomprehendable, because God is love all-encompassing. So that love fills my heart. His joy fills my heart. His peace fills my heart. His patience fills fills my heart and my life, and I am living in abundance. His kindness fills me. His goodness fills me, and it drives me to faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Amen. Amen. Amen? I mean, we're here today celebrating the resurrection of Jesus. Every single one of us in here, if you believe in the Lord, you follow the Lord, man, you have a reason right now just to get excited. And I mean, If you've been delivered, you have a reason to shout. If you've been saved, you have a reason to jump up and dance. Right? If you, any, anything, God has healed you. If you've been healed from God, just raise your hand really quick. God's healed you of a physical thing. Just say, physical. Physical, all over the place, right? If you had some sort of addiction that you dealt with before you knew Jesus, but God delivered you, anybody? All across the room. He has done so many. This is abundant life. He didn't just come to save you, but he came to fill you with his presence. Fill you with his love, fill you with his joy, overflowing over and over and over again. And it only gets better. It only gets better. It's good right now. I wake up in the morning and after I, I'll be honest with you. After I go, oh, yeah. You know, you hit 40 years old, that's what happens. Mornings aren't as fun as they used to be. You kind of creak and crack. I was with my son the other day, and I just tried to walk, and knees start. <laughs> I'm like, that's just not good. But after all of that, I'm like, thank you, Jesus, for your goodness, for your faithfulness, for your joy, because I have times where I don't feel joy, but then I come to the Lord, and he fills me with his joy. I have times where people drive me crazy, and I have no patience for them. I ask the Lord for patience, and he gives me patience. He reminds me, you know how he does that? He reminds me, I, I've been really patient with you. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, you're right. <laughs> Very patient with me. He's so amazing that way. But he fills us, fills us, fills us. And then there's this promise. One day, for every person who has given their life to Christ, surrender your hearts to him, because, by the way, you might not know this or not, but you will die. Some of you guys are really so cool that you like, may, may not. Is there any Enoch's in the room? Just walk with God and there was no more. But for the most part, we're all going to die. And when we die, the Bible is clear that it's appointed a man wants to die, and then what? Judgment. You want to hear a lot today? I read this thing the other day talking about Jesus was not the kind of person to judge. When Jesus came the first time, he came in grace and mercy and love and kindness because he was drawing people to himself, giving us an opportunity. That's how much he loves you. Even though you sin and you're separated from him, he loves you so much he's going to give you a shot over and over. you got a chance still. You're still alive. You still have a chance. I'm going to keep drawing you. But the second time, next time Jesus comes, it's clear in Scripture. He's coming to judge the world because he is a righteous judge. He's both full of love, grace, and mercy, but also justice. And sin is what is... I kind of don't want to stand before Jesus with sin in my life without surrendering to Jesus. But for those who are in Christ, he's gone to prepare a place for us that you can't even comprehend in your mind. Mind-blowing, incredible, beauty. No more sickness. No more tears, according to Scripture. Perfect. Abs. You like that one, don't you, Jeff? Perfect. Abs. Like, it's going to be this amazing love, life full. I mean, we're talking about, sometimes I feel like I'm so overwhelmed right now with the joy of the Lord, or I'm in worship, and I'm like, his presence is so good, he's so good to me. But then I can't imagine, there's time, you ever have those moments where this is so amazing, this experience I'm having with the Lord is so amazing, and it gets better. But not just better, it gets a lot better. Like, like mind-blowing better. The promise is not just that we get abundant life, joy, peace, all those things now, but the promise is it's eternal. And when we step into eternity, it's multiplied a thousandfold, millionfold, 
gazillion fold. What's the biggest number there is? That one. <laughs> like that one. That's what happens when I go and stand before Jesus. That's why I don't fear death. That's why death has no sting and no victory, because I'm like, bring it on. Like, I'll preach the gospel, and if you kill me for it, yeah! Not that I want to, you know, I got kids. They want their dad around, maybe. <laughs> but the bottom line is I, I look forward to the day where I'm with Jesus, because I know it is, if it's better than what I have now when I experience the Lord, by a lot, man, I want some of that. Abundant life. The real thing is Jesus is saying is that that life they had in the garden that was abundant before they knew evil, I want to take you there. Abundant life, full of goodness. Whew. That'll preach. <laughs> I'm containing myself just for you guys. Amen. We're going to pray in closing. They have a closing song that they're going to play. But I want you to play softly first. Don't go right into the song. The song's a little too exciting for me. <laughs> But in a moment, as we're going to pray, closing, I'm going to ask you today, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus, but you want to know Jesus, I want to give you the opportunity to know Jesus like I know Jesus. Um, I want to give you the opportunity to walk away from a life of destruction and sin, because that's what it is. It all leads to that, no matter what. You're a good person, but you still have sin. It still leads to death. Or you can step into abundant life this morning. Resurrection life life-transforming experience with Jesus. It's up to you. That's awesome. It's about it. It's God gives you a choice. He loves you so much. He just gives you a choice, right? So I'm going to pray, and if you want prayer for any reason, whether it's you have something in your body you need God to touch, we want to pray for you if you have. Um, but say today you're here, and you're like, I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to pray for you personally. Amen? Lord, we thank you right now for this amazing day. We're just grateful for your presence, and we're grateful, Lord, that you have come for us that you put on flesh in a human body, that you took the bruises. I mean, there's prophecies that were a thousand years before it even happened that were fulfilled in detail when you went to the cross. Wild to me even when I think about the detail that was involved of the prophetic words and how they were fulfilled. We are grateful that you would do that for us, that you were beaten for us, that you were bruised for us that your blood was poured out for us, that you became the perfect sacrifice so that we can step into abundant life. We thank you, Jesus, for that today. We're, again, this is not like a normal day where we're just going to, yay, we're going to go home and have some ham. No, we're going to honor you first, Lord. We're thankful for the cross, and we're thankful for the resurrection today. And we're thankful that we get to partake in that, Lord, because the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in us at the moment we give our life to you. We thank you for that today in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Again, if you need prayer for any reason, I want to pray with you. And there is leftover food, by the way, if you want to take some of that home. I was told by Suzette she doesn't want to take it home, so. <laughs> amen. We're going to do an old hymn to close, and it, by popular demand, especially from our birthday boy, Chuck. <laughs>
Dos and Nasty. Ale dos. Ale dos.